what we try and do with the film at the start is get you tell us a little bit about yeah, your ancestors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who your grandparents were yeah, and where they yeah. came from. Well, uh, my, par- my, my father was from Fenner and um, he was a wheelwright by trade and his um, father, his, his my grandfather was a wheelwright as well. But um, we came to Tremor then and uh, moved into Tremor in 1951. And we've been here ever since in Market Street. And then on the other side of your family, your, your, gra- your granny's side. Yeah, well, my mother's side was, uh, my mother was an Anderson. And she was from Luke's Well in County Kilkenny. And my mother's people were all great people for poetry and writing and all that kind of thing, like, you know. And it has followed on in the family. Because uh, one of my, May's, my Aunt May's grandson, now Kieran Foley, he's a, a journalist with the uh, Monster Express. And uh, my Aunt Kitty then, who was my mother's sister, she has a, 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 a granddaughter, uh, Danielle Barn, and she was the editor of the Irish Medical Times. She worked for the Medical Times and she often contributed to um, uh, Vincent Brown's programmes on th- on the telly, so there's a bit of writing in the in the family in the blood, like you know. And you do a bit of writing yourself. I do, yeah, yeah. I've been writing pieces for the Waterford News and Star for the Christmas supplement for, for the last forty years. I actually am the last man standing nearly for, and one of the earliest contributors. I know, yeah. Yeah. And and actually, before we get going. I think we should maybe make a, 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 a bit of a re- reference to and a tribute to Andy Taylor. Yeah, yeah, oh, of so course, yeah. Tell us about Andy. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andy Taylor was Tremor's premier historian. And uh, there isn't anybody in Tremor, or there isn't anybody around that knows as much about Tremor as Andy Taylor. He knows the seed, breed and generation of all the families in Tremor and he's the go-to man if anybody wants any information about Tremor. He's the cemetery manager up there for the Holy Cross Church and he, um, that's the undertakers and all that, defer to him like when they're looking for graves and people come to me, come to visit him like, you know, if they want to trace their ancestors or their families and anything like that. So um, there isn't anything Andy doesn't know about Tremor. And then he's got some amazing books. Oh, he has three marvellous books. Uh, uh, Tremor, the last book he done was Tremor of Long Ago. And prior to that then he had Echoes from a Seashell. That was about, all, an awful lot of that had to do with the clubs that were in Tremor. All the different various clubs, the Tremor GA Club, the Tremor Soccer Club, all different, um, the Cricket Club. And um, and then a, a little uh, the first book, then a, a glimpse of other days, mainly photographs about Tremor, covered everything from the very earliest prehistoric times right up to the present times and the war years and all that. And it was very important that that was captured, wasn't it? Oh yeah, 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 great stuff, mm. best of best of stuff, like you know what I mean. But uh, the undisputed historian of Tremor, anyway, mm. you know. Yeah, it's really important. And then <coughs> your own background then, you were born, where were you born in Tremor? I was born here in Tremor, yeah, yeah. Born and your family, what did your dad do? My father was a, was a wheelwright by, by uh, trade, like, you know, and he used to make wheels for carts and all that, like, you know what I mean? It was a kind of a very kind of a sophisticated art, like, you know, but it died out then when motor cars came in and all that kind of thing. Like, no, you know, he used to make them for carts. And I know, for the present generation wouldn't have a clue. No, so no, no. Tell us a little bit about it because it's very Well, he had a out in Fenner there, like, you know what I mean? There was, there was a kind of a little hut, uh, there was a little stone building out there. It was the workshop. And he worked there with his father and his brother. And they used to make the wheels for the uh, carts and uh, wheelbarrows. And uh, the, uh, the hut is still out, the... Uh, Building is still out there. I think the uh, uh, Fenner G A Club uses it as a as a um, dressing room. It must be about one hundred and fifty years old, I'd say. You know, and that's what they used to do. Like, but when uh, automation came in then, and uh, people started you know, motor cars and everything like that came in then, that finished uh, that finished them. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, would you remember? Like the carts and that? No, I wouldn't remember him, no. Although I have a few photographs of my father now in his workshop. 
and there was some photographs of him doing that, like, you know, but they were taken later in life. My father, um, when he gave up the wheel writing, he got a job with the county council as a carpenter. And he used to cycle from here, maybe to Port Law of a morning. He might cycle to Dunmore East. He might cycle to Dunhill. That would be, be a handy trip, like, you know what I mean? It, and uh, he eventually got a motorbike and then he got a small car, but... He went to work for uh, Tremor Fall to then afterwards as the maintenance carpenter, uh, carpenter down there. But he was obviously very good with his hands. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, all, me, all my brothers are all, um, they're all, my brothers are tradesmen. I have two, two brothers carpenters, and the other Jeff is a painter, like, you know. So uh, we have, um, it was all carpentry was, you know. <coughs> and then when you were small then, where did you, did you go to school in the CBS? Oh yeah, I went to school in the CBS, yeah. I went to the convent first, like, you know, up to um, the Star of the Sea convent. Then we went across the road to the Christian Brothers. And would there be loads of kids on the street when you were small? Oh, loads of kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strange thing about it is I'm the longest resident of the street now. They're all gone now. There's no kids in the street. You wouldn't see a kid here at Halloween or anything, like, you know? You know? And there's a photograph up there. It's up there in the corner there. That's the one that you'd like to see. It was taken in 1959. And it was the time the McCarthy Cup came to Tremor. Uh, the last time Waterford won the All-Ireland. The cup was brought into the classroom and we were all brought out into the backyard and we were lined up in front of the um, grotto and a photograph was taken of it and uh, Christian Brothers are all in it, Pat Fanning is in it, um, Frankie Welch, Seamus Power, so many more but that photograph it's a kind of an iconic photograph it was taken in 1959. It was taken by a man called Tom Welch from Liverstown. He was a freelance photographer. And he went upstairs to the school classroom and opened the window and took the photograph from the window. That's the photograph up there, I'll show it to you after. But um, there's not a trace of that exists. The grotto, anything there, gone, the school, everything is gone. There's not a trace of it exists, gone forever. And, um, that's and like the photographer you said was from Riverstone. Riverstone, Tom Welch was his name. Yeah, he died there about six months ago. Right. Yeah. Like Riverstone would be in a working class area. Oh, Riverstone, yeah, it would be a working class area. But there wouldn't, there wasn't anything down in Riverstone. It was an article I done there like some time ago. It's called the Wartime Christmas, and it was about Riverstone during the war years. And um, you can see that, uh, but uh, there was nothing. There wasn't anything down in Riverstone. A couple of few, a few cottages. There was moors of ocean view, and then there was Ambrose's Crow Valley House. That was always down there, and a few cottages. There was anything down there. I mean, there's a there's two or three estates down there now. Like you know, we have Pebble Beach and everything. But when I was a kid, now my father used to, my father sometimes he he do he used to do the maintenance on the cottages, and uh, he used to do all the repairs on the cottages. And sometimes he'd be seconded down to Riverstone to work on the cottages. I used to go down to meet him. And we'd cross the railway lane coming back up. I still remember the railway lane. You know, we, we'd cross the field in Riverstone and come up opposite the Majestic. And uh, that's a great memory to have. Like, you know, I go down to meet him. I'd be only about 10 or 11 years of age at the time. Oh, would you remember any of the people living there? Oh, God, I was, yeah. Well, Moors of Ocean View were there. They were kind of the, uh, they had a, a guest house down there. And then there was uh, Crow Belly House. They were the Ambrose family. And uh, Miss Ambrose. And I think her father was a solicitor. That was Crow Valley House. That's still down there now, and there was lovely stables attached to, it, attached to it. And and uh, when she died, she used to keep dogs there. She used to come up the town on a on a bicycle. I think it had one pedal, and one handlebar. But she used to make her way up. Very well liked woman. Now they were Protestant people, and um, when she died, anyway, they were. Um, she used to keep big dogs down in the house. Big. We, we used to be kids. We'd be passing. You'd hear them snarling, like you know. And you could see Miss Ambrose inside in the evening time and be getting dusky and she'd going up the stairs with a kind of a, a lamp or a candle or something like, you know, but she died down there. I think she was found dead down there. But um, there was an auction then, I think, down there and there were stables at the back of the house and there was lovely um, uh, coaches, old-fashioned coaches, like, like stage coaches. Somebody came and bought them. And I think somebody here in Tremor might have used them as one stage, like, you know, as a kind of a novelty to bring people around the tour of Tremor. But that was the Ambrose family. Douglas Pearson bought it afterwards. I think the Moore family have it now. It's called Crowbelly House. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a big house down the river. But the, all the other people were only living in little cottages. Marine Terrace wasn't there. Beach Park wasn't there. Uh, the GA Club, like, you know, that was... That was well, the, GA, the field was there, like, where the GA is, but there was nothing else there, like, you know, and um, the railway line used to pass out the road, like, you know, that, that way. And when you were back up here playing with the, with the kids and all that, what kind of things would you get up to? Would you would you stay around this area or would you venture off? Uh, should we go everywhere, like, you know, we'd go down around the amusements, like, you know, that was called going, that was called down around, like, you know what I mean? That's, that's where we used to go, like, you know, like I was telling you about the... Uh, Zoo Street and all that, like, you know. But Tell us about Zoo Street. Zoo yeah, Zoo well, uh, Zoo Street is, um, uh, the old timers used to call it Zoo Street. Now you have uh, where the, the Deluxe is, where the Sands is now. That's the Sands Hotel. That used to be the Deluxe Hotel. And prior to that, um, it was the Marine Hotel. But it was real, uh, there was a, a public bar beside the, the Deluxe was a kind of a genteel place now, like, you know, and there was a lounge bar. But there was a pub beside. There was a public place beside, real dark place. I think people used to just go in there drinking the shelter from the sun on a summer's day, like you know. But I used to often have to bring a man up there. Lark Hewn was his name. He was um, a blind accordion player, and um, Lark would have he'd, he'd have his few bob, like you know, and he'd be after playing, and you'd have to catch him by the hand and bring him up. He'd have his half one or whatever it is, and go back down again, like you know. But um, that road up there, roadway up there, they used to call it Zoo Street because there was Turkey Road, there was Lane Terrace, there was a pub on the corner run by a man called the Monkey Power. Around the corner, there was another pub run by the Cuckoo Murray. And across the road, there was Fox the Chemist, hence Zoo Street. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you're like going down around in those days when you were young. Was like was it exciting? Was oh it yeah, it was great fun all together. Like you know what I mean. We used to be going in the slot machines, and you'd be um, yeah, you'd be going around the laboule table, like you know, and um, the bumpers and all that kind of stuff, like you know, and Mackay's Fish and Chip Shop. That was uh, that's where Massimo's is now. Do you know Massimo's? Yeah. That's uh, Mackay's Fish and Chip Shop. But um, there was, a, I saw a sign in the window there one time, and it's hard to believe it, like, you know, in this day and age, but strong buy wanted for yard work, a play within. Uh, I was with my father, me say, I was with my father the same day, and he looked down at me. I was looking for a summer job, he said, you'd earn your few bob in there, he said. We just moved on. <laughs> yeah, strong buy wanted for yard work. Yeah, yeah. They were at Mackay's, yeah, fish and chip shop. There was a row broke out in there one night and there was a, the, all the tables were scattered all over the place. There used to be sawdust on the floor. There was a fire broke out there another, another night. The fire brigade went in and put it out and they were back in business in a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where did you work down there? Did you get a job? Oh, I did, yeah. I worked in, uh, worked, uh, worked in the amusements, but uh, mainly I worked in the deluxe. I was, a, I was a kitchen porter there for a while. Got promoted into hall porter. Then I became the night porter. The night porter then, and um, there was a they had a primitive kind of a heating system down there, like you know they hadn't gas or anything. You had to keep uh, there was a boiler down there, and you had to keep shoveling all night, like a mini version of the Titanic. I fell asleep one night anyway, and the whole thing went out. There was pandemonium the next morning when they when they got up. No hot water for the residents or anything, like you know. So I think I was demoted back into the kitchen. You know, I was there another night, and um, there, there was um, I was I think I was a night porter there, there another night, like you know, read really, very dry spell, like you know, and um, there was um, uh, an order. You see, these they used to have to get the coal the whole time, bags of coal, bags of coal the whole time, and um, the coal man came down with the coal anyway, like you know, as we was out in the the side side of the thing anyway, the coal, and uh, the next thing was. Um, fired all the coal, bags and bags of coal, and there was a shore outside in the yard, uh, and, and um, he covered the shore, and there was a thunderstorm that night, and of course the rain had nowhere to go. The, the only place it went was out the hall, the hall of the hotel, like, you know, and um, there was a kind of place called the Residence Lounge, and it kind of diverted there, like, it went in there, and swung around through it, and came back out again, and went flowing down the steps of the hotel. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's happened that night as well, like, you know. But, uh, yeah. 
And then, where else did you work down in Tremor at that stage? I worked down in the pitch and put course with Mary Armstrong. You know, if you remember Mary, Mary was an eccentric, eccentric kind of a lady. Great crack altogether, like, you know. She knew everybody and anybody. All the show bands used to come to Tremor. And they'd be, um, all the show band stars would come there and they'd all start. They'd hand out their little calling cards, like, you know, picture of the band. She had them plastered all over the wall of the thing. You could hardly see inside with the, all the things, like, you know. She had a great rapport with all the customers that were in there. All, she knew everybody by name. And she knew certain people, like, they'd use a certain kind of a club. Oh, you like this kind of a club. You like that kind of a club. I kept this one for you. Some fellas used to like a light putter. Other people would like a heavy putter. Some people would use a number seven or another use a number eight or and she knew exactly. And she used to have the teas. Uh, you'd get a I think it's for about a half a crown you could get a, a putter and driver, a couple of teas and a golf ball. And the next thing was um, she used to have the teas tied on a kind of a, a string like, you know, so the way you wouldn't lose them. Everything was done done to a tea, as they say. But she was, um, Mary is very eccentric, but um, she used to, I, I did about two or three seasons working down there in the hut with her, like, you know, and she'd always send me a tenner at Christmas. Tenner was a lot of money then, but she'd send me a tenner at Christmas, yeah. She's, um, she'd, uh, she was the manageress down there. And there was a little shop behind it as well. And it was, uh, the kiosk was divided. The, the shop was out on the prom side. They used to sell sweets and all that there. And she used to manage the two of them at one time. But eventually, probably came too much for her, so she just managed the pitch and put, the kiosk. That's all she used to do. She'd be leaning out over the door, like, you know, she'd be waving to everybody going past, like, you know. All the kids from Riverstown used to come up there. Do you want any messages, Mary? Because she was very generous, like, you know. She might send them up to town for a message or something, like, she'd give them a few bob, like, you know. She used to send me up to, um, when I, I used to be down in the morning, at about, I used to start at 12 o'clock. I'd be home for my dinner then at two o'clock. I'd have to go back down then until eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night. But she used to, she'd thunder the horses. She used to give me um, a couple of pounds every day to back the horses. She was a great follower of Piggott. She was a great follower of Lester Piggott. And uh, she gave me about two pounds. A lot of money now in those days, like, you know what I mean? Two pounds every day. And uh, she had up to powers the bookies. She was on a good run there at one stage, like, you know, and. I think one of the clerks down there didn't want to. He said, "If this continues, we won't be able to. <laughs> if she continues winning, we won't be. We'll be we should have to bring her customer elsewhere." I told her she was going mad, like you know. But so she was there to pick about then. Oh, she was, yeah. But that was in her background because she was a niece to, or she was a niece of Senator Parkinson. Uh, he was uh, oh, famous up from uh, Betty Carnan. He was a famous horse owner, horse breeder. And uh, she used to travel the world with him as a child, buying horses, and he used to be buying horses. That you know, was okay. very, very. But uh, so he was a local breeder then. Yeah, he was. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a senator, like in the Free State State Government, like you know, a very big, a big shot, like you know. The Parkinson family are still up there. Some members, I think, of the Parkinson family still up there in Belly Carnan, like you know. But uh, she was, uh, Mary was a great character altogether. There's a, the Hydro, of course, was there, like, you know, you see photographs of the Hydro, I have a few photographs there. Hydro was there and the... Um, Did you ever go to the Hydro? Oh, I was in the Hydro heaps of times, yeah. I was down in the boiler room of the Hydro as well down there. My father used to have a workshop down there. And, um, yeah, God, there was state-of-the-art equipment down there. Yeah, every that, that was kind of, kind of like a spa, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a spa, yeah. It was built, I think it opened in 1947 or thereabouts, like, you know. But um, it was, um, people used to, uh, you could have seawater bats, uh, seaweed bats, all that. And it was state of the art at the time. I'm sure the building was very much state of the art as well, like, you know. But the hydro was there, you had the pitch and put course. You had a hydro and you had a little putting green and a fountain. And then you had another pitch and put course near the kiosk, and you had what they called the big course out further then, like, you know. And uh, the pitch and put, uh, the members of the pitch and there was a pitch and put club started here in 1947 in Tremor. And that's where they started down there. There was an old bog that was after being drained. And they started down there, so there was members, and then, the, then there was uh, the tourists that used to come. I think it was the half a crown. If things were quite like you could do a second round on it, like you know, but usually be called in after 
after the first round, like, you know, it's just really got good entertainment. Uh, is that the same club then that moved up to... That's the same the club, metal yeah, man. they moved up to the Metal Man, yeah, 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 they moved up to the Metal Man. And uh, they were in a few different places in Tremor, but that's where, that's where they, I think that's mainly where they started off, like, you know. Okay. Yeah. And then, <coughs> when you went to, did you go to the cinema when you were a kid? Oh, yeah, God, we used to go there regularly, like, you know, over to the Rex. The Rex was... Um, Rex was a famous cinema and from our um, mother used to give us a few bob like to go over there. And uh, Rex is just over at the end of the street here. This Cahill's shop now. The Rex was opened in 1945 and it was a state-of-the-art cinema when it opened. But uh, by the time we went there it wasn't much state-of-the-art. <laughs> <laughs> it was a stage. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, it was uh, it's a famous place like, you know, and Rocky Mills used to be there and Sometimes when the film would break down, we'd be all shouting, we want our money back, we want our money back. And Rocky Mills would be called to go up uh, to do a, no a number while they were repairing the projectors. Rocky would do his piece on the on the stage, like, you know. But I remember being over there one time there, there was a, supposed to be a, a, we were kids, like, you know, and there was some, a mystery man, they were saying. There was a mystery man in Tremor, like, you know. And... Um, some fella, probably, some figment of our imagination anyway, it was probably in the winter time, like, you know, but we were over there anyway and the picture broke down. Next thing everybody started shouting, uh, Rocky, we want Rocky, we want Rocky, we want our money back. So Rocky loped up to go up on the screen to, and he cast a big shadow on the wall. Somebody shouted, it's just a mystery man. <laughs> there was pantomime, I don't know how, that, but about 200 kids got out through the door in about two minutes. <laughs> yeah. But um, there was... Um, uh, I was sitting there, there was um, Errol Flynn, he, he starred in a lot of movies over there, but the um, ups, uh, just near the thing, Corcoran's had a lodging house. And um, Errol Flynn was in so many films over there, somebody said he was lodging over in Corcoran's. You know? <laughs> but uh, Mrs. Lenhan then, she had a sweet shop right opposite the, um, right opposite the cinema. Tommy Lenhan, that was her husband. Tommy was... Um, a West Cork man, and he came to Tremor. Uh, he came with Johnny McGurk. He was a famous showman. He came here to work for him. They moved up to Market Street then, and they converted the front of their house into a little shop, and they used to sell apples and ice cream and and uh, sweets. They made a they made a living there, like you know. And Tommy was an insurance man then as well, like you know. He used to sell sure insurance and. Um, he used to have the Galen pools, and they'd have a Galen used to have little coupons, like you know. And Tommy used to come into. My father was followed the football pools, like you know. And Tommy would come into the kitchen here, and he'd be pulling out the he'd be pulling out the coupons out of his pocket like a conjurer. He'd have them all over the place, like you know. And my father would be sitting back there of a an autumn evening, like you know, and the evening would be drawn in and fag hanging out of his mouth and he ticking them off, like you know. And you'd hear the clip voice of the announcer on the radio. Tottenham Hotspur, Queen's Park Rangers, all thing, and my father would be Tottenham down. He had a preference for the Scottish League. Um, St Mirren, Partick Thistle, Hearts of Midlothian, Queen of the South, and he'd be taking them off. He never had any look at them. But uh, Tommy was, uh, he, he sold insurance then as well. <coughs> so between the shop and everything, like, you know, but um, that's where we used to go. We used to go across to, um, we used to go across to, um, Lenhans to get the sweets and all that. But what they used to do there as well in the shop, they used to take in bicycles. All the chaps used to come in from the country, like, you know, they'd come from up, they'd come from Fenner and all these places to the pitchers. And they'd go down, maybe go down to the Atlantic. And for sixpence, you could leave in a bicycle in Lenhans. I think they used to leave them in the sitting room, like, I don't know how they used to fit them all in, like, you know. And uh, so they, they got that in, but um, they'd have to stay there, wait up then at two o'clock in the morning for some fella to come back to reclaim his bicycle, like, you know. But uh, full of bicycles, the, the, that, that was another way they managed to generate a little bit of finance. And then there was, uh, what was it? Tommy, Tommy was... Um, Who was projectionist when you were a small? Uh, John O'Rourke was there for years and years, and his father was there prior to that, like, you know, down in... Uh, uh, his father worked for the Breen family nearly all his life. Uh, his, his, uh, John's father worked for the Breen family most of his life. And he um, he worked in the casino cinema down there, like, you know. But um, anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the 
Rex opened in 1945 and it was a state of the art cinema, like I told you. But prior to that, in 1942, uh, it was uh, the casino. And that's there where the holiday shops is now. Do you know where the holiday shops are? Yeah. Down there, yeah. Well, that's where that, that where the casino was. And it, afterwards, it would started life as the Palace Ballroom. And then it became the casino. And then it became uh, the Silver Slipper Ballroom. You remember the Silver Slipper now, like, you know? Um, Thin Lizzy played there. I think Rory Gallagher played there. Bruce Shields. And, um, but uh, the casino opened in 1942. And the um, first film there was The Flying Juices, Laurel and Hardy. And it was owned by a man called Tom, uh, Tom Cooper. And Tom Cooper was a garage owner down in Killarney. And um, he, owned a, he owned a good few cinemas. And they all bore the name The Casino in different parts of the country. But um, as far as I know, there's still a casino cinema down in Killarney. But um, he made the very first feature film that was ever made in Ireland. It was called The Dawn. And it was made with a cast of unknowns down in County Kerry. It was all locals. And it was made over a period of maybe about 12 months. He'd round up the locals on a Sunday and they'd choose a scene. It was about, it was about the war of independence. But the film got a release in America and it got a release in England and it made more than made his money back. So Tom, Tom, uh, Tom uh, Cooper ran that then from uh, 1942 until 1948. And the Ricks opened up in 1945 and that kind of was the death knell for the casino. Although down in the casino, it was, the casino was regarded as the films were of a much better quality, much better films. And um, the last film shown there, they went out in a blaze of glory anyway, it was called In Old Chicago, it was about the Great Chicago Fire. And that was the last film that they showed there in 1948, so it closed down. But my father was a great film reward, he used to love going down to the casino, he was always talking about it. His favourite stars were um, uh, Alan Ladd and uh, Frank Morgan. And he used to talk about the films he saw there, This Gun for Hire, and um, um, another film there. I always thought it was a great title for a film. It was an adventure film, Reap the Wild Wind. You couldn't go wrong with a title like that. And um, my mother was telling me there about uh, an incident that happened down there. My mother used to like to go down there as well. But um, it was in the month of November. It was about 1944. And there was a famous film shown down there called The Song of Bernadette. And um, for a prank, there was this local girl. Somebody asked her to dress up as a nun. No. So she dressed up as a nun on this dark November night. And there was no street lighting, as far as I know, in Tremor at, that, at that time. It was only gas lighting. Electricity hadn't come this far. So she walked through the town in the, in the darkness. Now, it would be very unusual to see a nun out at that hour of the night, on a November's night, going through the street. So when she, so she made her way down to the casino and walked into the cinema and walked, well, whatever to be about seeing a nun out on the, in the night, and for more like seeing her in a cinema, <laughs> would be out of question. She caught pandemonium down the cinema. Oh, it was a big story at the time now and all that, like, you know, people, the whole town was talking about it, like, you know, it would probably be on the television now if it hadn't, like, you know. But that's, that, that's a story I always remember, my mother telling me, yeah. And you just remind me of another story about the, about the back strand about a ghost. What was that? The oh, yeah, that was the Goromu look, like, you know, that was supposed to be a kind of a, a ghostly horseman. He used to ride through the boroughs, like, on a stormy winter night like you know there's a kind of a little place down there if you ever go down there it's a uh, shrubbery and everything down there they call it the Goromugox garden and that's it's a garden there's all shrubs and everything growing down there and I remember in the 1960s um, Tom uh, McCarthy used to uh, do pony trekking and uh, Tom McCarthy had a chip shop down there at the end of the prom, like, you know, down, down that Moe's area, that area, like, they're still there, like, in the McCarthy family, like, you know, but um, Tom used to do pony trekking down there, like, you know, you could hire a horse, like, the, uh, 10 bob, I think, or something, and you could go down there on the horse. There'd be somebody to lead you down, there may be about, they probably six or seven horses, like, you know, and that's 10 bob you bring down. But I remember being down there in the centre of that place, the Goromulux Garden, as they call it, and there was a little well down there with fresh spring water coming up it, and the horses used to water there. 
But I've been down there a load of times since I've never seen it. Could never. But I, I, I confirmed it with a few people like that I'd been down there. They knew it was there, all right. But you know, sand and all, sandy and all as it was, there was fresh water trickling up there. It used to be full of foxes as well, like one time, like you know. But I don't know whether they're there any longer. Of course, the rabbits died out as well, like you know. And you mentioned the silver slipper. Uh, do you did you go to any of the dances? Oh, I did. Yeah, several times. Yeah, yeah, several times. So there was used to be concerts there as well, like you know. Was uh, the Swore Cayley band used to play down there, and concerts were down there. Yeah, yeah. There used to be discos down there. There was um, uh, variety shows. I remember Brendan O'Dowd had a variety show down there for once, one season there. Like you know, there was a man in it called Birdie Sweeney. He was one of the cast. He was afterwards in that series Belly Kiss Angel. He played Eamon in it. He was in it for most of the series. He was a, D- a Donegal man, and. Uh, yeah, there was a variety show there around for a thing. And what about the Atlantic? Oh, the Atlantic, yeah, sure. Everybody played in the Atlantic, like, you know what I mean? All the big stars of the era, like, you know, Jim Reeves. Jim Reeves came there in uh, 1964, shortly before he died. And um, Temperam- uh, Gentleman Jim, they used to call him. I think the more appropriate term would be temperamental, Jim, because he used to be always seemed to be there always seemed to be problems like anywhere he played, like you know, with the piano being out of tune and different things, like you know. But anyway, the story goes that when he was coming into the town, anyway, he was coming into the town in a car with his driver, like you know, and at that, at that stage, like you know, uh, people were uh, the county council. All they had for for road cleansing was a uh, was a, a poor. A, a horse and trap, or a horse and trap, like, you know, and um, for picking up the rubbish. He, apparently the car nearly collided with the, Jim Reeves' car nearly collided with the horse coming down Galway's Hill, and he said to the driver, what kind of a one-horse town is this? <laughs> so the story goes anyway, like, you know, and um, what's his name, uh, Chubby Checker played down there, you know, the man with the twist, Helen Shapiro, uh, Mr. Acker Bilk, Oh, there were several. There were several more now. Like, you know. It was a big venue. Wasn't it? Oh, that was a huge venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, all, they had all the orchestras down there as well. Like you know, that's what was more, more nearly famous for. Like you know, the orchestras. Um, Phil Morta, he was a famous orchestra. He had a famous orchestra. That'd be long before my time. Now they'd be in the forties. Oh, they used to do a residency there, like okay. you know, and um, they'd do a summer residency there. And when you were small, had it already changed from, uh, was it still a ballroom? Or oh, was it's it? still a ballroom. Oh, gee, okay. it was, yeah. She had all the show band stars coming there the whole time, like, you know what I mean? You had the Royal, sure, the Royal used to attract a massive crowd there. You had the, um, what do you call it, um, Brendan O'Brien and the Dixie Landers, the Pacific show band. We saw them all down there. Well, we, we saw them all going in there, like, you know, was, I mean, we used to get their cards. We used to get the cards off them, like, you know, the souvenir cards off them, but... And what, what were they? Just tell us what they were. They were just a little postcard with a photograph of the band on it. Sometimes you'd have a, a little message on the back of it, like saying that who the manager of the band was. And you'd collect them? You'd collect them, yeah. They're collector's items. So you'd often see them on Ireland's own, people looking for them. Like, you know, you mightn't get them a fortune for them, but you'd probably get a couple of euros for them, like, you know, some of the better ones, like, you know. But we had them all, like, you know, we had them going back to the time of the Clipper Carlton. You know who were the kind of forerunners of the um, of the um, Royal Show band, but the Royal were the biggest draw down there. But there was, I mean, most of the bands were doing very well. Like you know, sure, there was hundreds of show bands in Ireland at that now, stage. Who used to book them in? Then? Well, whoever owned the thing, uh, whoever owned the ballroom, I suppose, used to book them in. Like you know what I mean? But uh, I and for the Silver Slipper, like to get bands like you know. You were talking about Skid Row and Tin Lizzy and yeah, Roy Gatter. Yeah. Like, that was kind of a very interesting lineup. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a great lineup, like, you know. Them, was, yeah. Well, some of the clubs, like, you know, here in Tremor, like, would hire them, like, you know what I mean? That's what the, the clubs had hired them, like, you know, it maybe come down to a benefit for them, like, you know what I mean? That's the way it was done, like, you know. But, um, it was all, most of the bands were, most of the bands played there, like, you know, I mean, you see. And then when you were growing up, then, I, uh, like, did you go to, did, did you leave at 12 from school? Oh, no, no, I didn't, no, 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 I went, I worked up to, uh, went up to the Leaving Cert, like, you know. Where'd you go then? I went to, uh, 
I worked in Waterford in a factory for a few years then, but I went to, I went to the post office eventually, like, you know, and that's where I went afterwards, like, you know. So. And when you were a postman, were you in Tremor? Or no, I was in, uh, I was in, I was in Tremor for a few weeks, but I did my, all my service in Waterford, like, you know, okay. I did, yeah, I retired there seven years ago. And then with, just, even from your own, you, you mentioned a few people, like, but, just you know, the characters are around yeah, small when yeah. you're small. Oh, I choose the town's team and my characters. What, what about the shops and all that? What would oh, you yeah. remember? Ah, uh, yeah, but I'm sure there was marvellous characters in Tremor, like, you know, when I was growing up, like, you know what I mean? You had Limerick Bill. You had um, Mal Galvin. Richie, Richie Power. Um, who, who was Mal Galvin? Mal Galvin, and um, she was Richie Power's mother, like, you know, she used to clean the school. But uh, probably the best character that was ever in Tremor, in my time anyway, like, was Tom Cusick. Tom was the church circus. And I was um, an altar boy during Tom's time as the circus. He was a distant relative of mine, in fact. But Tom was uh, a low-sized, slow-moving man with a kind of a wrinkled face and a head of hair like steel wool. And uh, I remember uh, up in the church, like, he was famous for his kind of wit, like, it was irreverent, like, but it wasn't a, a malicious. And the priest used to have great time for him, like, you know. But I remember standing in the churchyard one night, like, you know, there was three of us in the churchyard, bitterly cold January night, an east wind blowing. And uh, Tom was fond of his pint now and his half one, like, you know what I mean, his drop of rum. So there was three of us in the churchyard. There was Father Elward, Tom Cusick and myself. And I had a light surplus soutan on me. I was shivering in it. And uh, Tom, I could hear the ho holy water bucket and it shaking in Tom's hand. And Father Elbert, he was a nice, gentle, refined man. And we were waiting for the funeral to come up anyway, and there was no sign of the funeral coming. And we were looking down Summer Hill, and next thing the funeral came around the corner. There was an old man in Tremor. Came around the corner and it stopped. Five minutes went by. Ten minutes went by. There was still no sign of it moving off. And the next thing was, uh, Father Elbert craned out his neck and he said, I wonder what's causing the delay, Tom. Maybe they're going to link him up, Father. It's just tough. Father Elbert's face broke into a big grin and next thing the funeral off it came. But, uh, but uh, we were in the, uh, uh, the church uh, another night. Um, we were up there another night and uh, it was coming up to Christmas. A lovely uh, crib in the church, like, you know. It was before this present one that was there, like, you know, before the present one there was... Tom was still sarcast in there anyway and... There were women praying in the church, like um, three women there. I think this church used to see open until about nine o'clock or ten o'clock at night. I couldn't be sure, but uh, the women were praying in front of the crib and Tom couldn't get him out. It was gone past the closing time in the church and it was heading up for closing time and down in Connolly's pub, like, you know, so something had to be done. So Tom went over anyway after a few minutes. I think he even called time ladies, please, but to no avail. He went over anyway and he tipped one of the women on the shoulder. He said, you'll have to get out of here. He said, I have to change the infant's nappy. <laughs> so um, we were up there, uh, it was up there another time. I was beside him on the altar and it was Ash Wednesday. And there were uh, people, the um, uh, priest, priest was administering the ash lake, you know. And Tom had a little thing there, a little tureen there with a spoon in it. And some people used to come up at that stage and they'd have a bit of newspaper with the older ladies and they'd look for a bit of ash, like, you know, and he'd spoon in the ash. This lady, anyway, elder lady, she put out the, this paper and she stuck it out. He put in a spoon of ash into it. She held it out the next time and he put another spoon into it. And when she held it out the, the third time, he said, you must be going to plant geraniums in it. You know? But he was the kind of a character now that Tom, like, you know, was... Um, he was uh, fond of his drink, like, you know, he was a great character. And uh, there was another great character then, Mickey Cullen Power. He was out from Westtown. Later, he went uh, down to Riverstown afterwards, like, you know, he was a fisherman. But uh, Mickey was a little low-sized, stocky man with his cap fixed firmly on the Kildare side. And Mickey, Mickey used to, uh, he was working in the building trade and he used to do a bit of fishing as well. He had a little boat and he used to fish out of the pier, mainly for mackerel. And who used to be sometimes with him was the former Mount Sign Hurler, Jim Hurley. And then there was another man, Bunny Rocket from Westtown, or from the Fenner area. They were out there one evening anyway in the boat and uh, fishing a late autumn evening. 
and uh, fishing was very bad. Fish weren't biting at all. They came in, they only had about a half a box when they came in. So they carried the box up to, uh, up near the Ritz bar and they'd sell it on the corner there. There was a, a tourist passing, an American tourist passing. And he came over to buy some fish and he was looking down and he said, he remarked on the small catch. He said to Mickey, he said, uh, very small catch. I'll tell you the truth, sir, says Mickey. The fishing was going great, he said, until uh, the big shark came up and rammed the boat. My God, says the American, was it a blue shark or a white shark? I couldn't tell you, sir, says Mickey, but by the time Bunny was finished baiting him with the oar, he was black and blue. <laughs> they were the kind of characters, like. Huh? But anyway, go back to your question. The shops. Yeah. Well, can you remember any of the shops? Oh, there? I do. I remember the shops. Yeah, the O'Flaherty's were over there. Um, uh, it's uh, a drapery shop. There was two sisters in there, Kathleen and May. And um, they were twins. But they didn't look like each other at all. One was a real slim, narrow woman. And the other was a kind of a heavy woman. And they lived there with their brother, Tim. And Tim was uh, working in Heron's drapery store in Sidon Waterford. Uh, they were the last people in the street to get a television set. They had an old Murphy wireless. They used to get all their, wear they used to get all their news on the Murphy wireless. And afterwards, a lovely, lovely piece of furniture. My brother has it now. My father bought it off him for a fiver. But uh, they were very religious people. Oh, salt of the earth. But um, when they got the television set, it was said that they only turned it on for the Angelus, the News and the Virginian. That was the one. And not, not the Late Late Show? No, no, no. But that was it, just the three programmes. And uh, then there was, uh, who's this? Um, then there was Little uh, Lenhan's Shoe Shop, or Lenhan's Sweet Shop over there. That was lovely. Uh, that was just where I would tell you they used to take in all the bicycles. And then there was, uh, in the Market Street, then there was uh, Jackie Power, he was a shoemaker. He had a shoe. It was a, a, a street, or the streets of Tremor seemed to be full of shoemakers and people doing repairs to shoes. Like you know, there was an awful lot of them at that time. Well, there was the that? coal store over there then. Well, where was the shoe I shoes? couldn't tell you. Like you know what I mean? I suppose maybe people would buy a pair of shoes and they try and get as much life out of them as they could. Like just keep repairing them. Like you know, my father used to repair our shoes here. He had a last, and he used to use old bits of tires and all that kind of thing. He cut them up. Like you know, he'd get spare and he'd build up the shoe like he was very good at that kind of thing like you know then there was Mr. Matthews down there down there uh, he had a he had a nice uh, he had a nice grocery shop my mother used to do all her dealings there with him like you know you get a, a little discount there or some every time you get every time you buy something like you know you get a few to be entered into the book at Christmas you might get a cake or something like you know what I mean and uh, there was loads of shops like you know um and the 15th of August? Oh, the 15th of August, 15th of Ireland, they used to call it here, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a busy day, like, you know, all the relatives, all my mother's cousins and brothers would come here. It'd be a right day, like, you know, it'd be a very busy day. And uh, down in the Deluxe, I think we were, what's it, in the Deluxe we used to get, I think you get, ex, you get double time or something for that, like, it would be working round the clock. But um, I remember my mother telling me there, like, you know what I mean, that, I mean, when I was growing up, it was fairly hectic, the 15th of August, but even years before that was supposed to be really hectic. But um, there used to be a, the deluxe down there now, and the public bar and the deluxe and all the books, they, they used to run out of drink. And Sullivan's used to have a kind of a shuttle service coming out from all crates of beer, like all through, the, the pubs used to close maybe about two or three in the morning. And there'd be shuttle service of crates of large bottles coming out like you know in lorries like you know to keep the people stocked up that was another another yeah oh would you bother go to the races yourselves ah no no i was never great for that race but i went a few times like but I never went in the front door we used to get in over the fence like you know, there was a fence out at the back like you know we climb in over that like you know never i don't even remember being going in like you know and then obviously there was huge numbers of visitors. Oh yeah, oh, it's a town to be thronged, like, you know, it's a town to be thronged. People used to take in lodgers and all that, like, you know. You used to take in lodgers and um, just the town used to be packed then, like, you know. People, the fellas on the, the tote men used to come here, like, you know, the, the, the tote. And uh, they, they, they'd stay in Tremor, like, you know. I mean, if, if you had a room where they'd nearly sleep on the floor. You know, they'd be up there maybe for the week. 
and uh, they'd be just looking for accommodation. They'd suppose when they'd be finished, they'd go off for a few pints, and you know, they'd need somewhere to sleep for the night. Then, like you know, mm. oh, I'd just be thronged, like you know, the town people. And how did you get on with the fellas, the visitors, like the townies or the people? Yeah, I've never had any on. problem like that at all. Like you know, there was a few families in the street there. Like you know, what I mean, there was the feelings there. Like you know. Sean, like, you know, he owned the St. Ledger up there. He he left Tremor and went up to Dublin. And uh, he had his family up there, like, but the family used to come down with him. They used to spend the summer in Tremor. He had uh, two or three kids, maybe four kids of our age. And his father often said it to me afterwards, like, he said, the kids just hop out of the car, he said, and go straight over to the local kids. And, you know, mm. yeah, they'd be looking forward to coming down. They'd be only down five minutes and they'd be playing with his open Powers Field. There was a field up there at the back, it was called Powers Field. And they used to come up there and play with us, like, you know. And Joe, when you were growing up, were you more interested in soccer or GA? What was the thing? Well, it was, uh, well, I, I wasn't much into sport now, to be honest, which my, my brother Eddie now, and my other brother, Jerry, they were, they were, they were, Eddie was more into um, GA. He won an awful lot of medals. He'd done a bit of boxing and he played soccer. Jerry played soccer as well. No, they were more into that, like you know, than I was. And the boxing uh, place was just over here. Yeah, it's it? just over there. Yeah, the boxing club was up there. P.T. Graham used to have the boxing club up oh. there, like you know. But that was a great place too, for a great place for kids, like you know. But uh, shifted around. Uh, it used to be down in. Uh, actually, it's it started off down the Silver Slipper. Well, it's, that's where they used to have the tournaments down the Silver Slipper. And then they went to the assembly rooms down there. They used to call that the Sinn Féin Hall. I think they used to use that. And then they went down to the Tremor House. That's another place that they used to go to, down to the Tremor House. And eventually they got their own place up here. And they often have tournaments up there now. It's a lovely place. And P.C. Graham, he was a bit of a character too. Oh, he was a great character altogether, yeah. yeah. You should speak to his son Norman. Norman would be able to fill you in a lot about, about P.C. Like, you know, Norman would be... And then his brother had the Pope. Dermot, that's yeah. right, yeah, the three swans in, yeah, mm -hmm. that used to be Corcoran's one time, like, you know, but Dermot had that for a good few years. I used and to often go over there for a pint. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask you, when you got to a certain age and you started going out for a drink, yeah. what were the pubs in Tremor did you remember? Well, I remember all the pubs, the pubs I remember, like, some great pubs in Tremor, like, you know, everybody used to be smoking in those days, like, you know, everybody smoking and drinking, like, you know what I mean, probably driving, sadly, to say it too, like, you know, but... Uh, that's some great pubs in Tremor. We used we used to nearly always use Robinsons now up at Summer Hill, like you know, our family. That's nearly where we always went, like, you know. But there was loads of other pubs, like, you know, but um uh, there was a pub up in the main street it was uh, the Widow Powers. They used to call it the Blue Lookout for some reason or other. I don't know why it got that name. There was um uh, Connolly's. That was a famous pub, like, you know, that's uh, the Forge now. And um, well, said we uh, you had the pubs down the town. You had a kind of a different set, like you know, you had people that drank down at the bottom of the town, and then people that drank up at the top of the town. Like you know, there was kind of a divide. I always found that there was a kind of a divide. Some people always stayed up at the top of the town. Other people said that some people would be identified with a particular pub, like you know, somebody would say, "That's his house." You know, as much as say that's where he drinks, that's his house. You know. I said that to somebody one time, they thought he owned the pub. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talking about divide, was there a kind of a, a kind of a class system in, you know, in place? Like when you were young, did you remember like, oh, they were, they were the crowd with money and they were the ones that didn't have money? I don't, I don't remember. I, I suppose there was that, like, you know, I never kind of really noticed that, like, you know what I mean? You I didn't become self-conscious about it? No, I didn't become self-conscious about it or anything, like, you know. I remember, like, you know what I mean, at one stage, like, you know, I mean, the Protestant people, like, you know, maybe kept a little bit to themselves, like, you know, and then the Catholic people kept to themselves, like, you know. But when that Canon Porter came to Tremor then, like, you know, he had three sons. And they used to mix with all the Catholic kids and all that. And they used to play soccer on the strand. They used to back, back the horses, like, you know, so. So that was all broken? Then. That was all broken. It's, you, you know what I mean? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But and just in, the, in relation to the Catholic stuff, was there, the other way, say, my mother would have had a favourite saints and all that. 
you remember any superstitions from the old people that that, that were around? That no, I don't back? seem. I can't think of it offhand now. Like you know, it's been offhand. Like you know, I spent a lot of time up in the church there, and there was an altar by. Like you know, there was um, there was um, there was a priest who used to come to the come to Tremor. He was he was a Jesuit, Father Willie Stevenson, and uh, he was born about eighteen eighty eight, and I think he died about nineteen eighty. And he was from the Priest Road originally. Like his father was a doctor, and he was one of about ten or eleven children. I think his mother was a Sherlock from Waterford, from around uh, Catherine Street. But um, his father was a very well liked doctor. But Father Willie Stevenson went off to uh, join the Jesuits, and I think he served as a chaplain in the First World War, and he did time in Australia and things like that. But he used to come. He had never lost his affection for Tremor. And he used to come back to Tremor on the 15th of August every year for two weeks, holidays. And he'd send, he'd, he'd um, stay up in a, a guest house on Summer Hill. And um, what he'd do for the whole fortnight then, he'd spend the whole time travelling around the town and the countryside by foot, visit, visiting people, looking in on people and visiting and recalling old times. And he'd have his pocket full up of butterscotch toffees to give to the kids. But... Uh, Fine, big man with piercing blue eyes, but uh, very, very, very popular man. And um, but he he he'd go down to Ballynock Lane now. He'd walk down to Ballynock Lane and walk all the whole way out up through Ballynock, visiting all the cottages, and um, dropping in on people, having a chat, and moving on again. Then and he'd break out maybe in Sport House or Knockin. That's how far out he'd go, and maybe off out to Fenner. But he used all by foot. And you hear people saying we have Father Stevenson here today, like you know, like as if you're out getting a visit from the Pope, like you know. But uh, very well liked, very well respected man. I always remember. What was him. He, you said he, was he connected to the Sherlock? Yeah, he had. So I think his mother was a Sherlock from Waterford, like you know. There's uh, people by the name of Sherlock. Uh, I think from the Catherine Street area, like you know. Because it's but, a Sherlock House, don't Yeah, Sherlock House. Yeah, well, they'd be, he'd be the same people. They'd be the same people. Yeah, yeah. Whether there's anybody by that name living there now, like you know what I mean. But uh, but his mother, right, as far as I know, was there. But uh, she was. Uh, but he was a he was a very well liked man now. Like, and obviously, and that goes way back then. If he's back to that era. Oh yeah, it's way back. Yeah, he lived up on the Priest Road. The house is still there where he lived. Like you know, his father. His father was a was a doctor here. But uh, great. And, and well, he used to come here. I'm sorry, Ollie, but he used to come here uh, to visit because my father had an old uh, had an old aunt, and she worked for the family, so that was the connection. And he'd always call here. This would be one of his last ports of call. Like you know, he'd be after doing the whole countryside. Like you know what I mean, Fenner. He imagine walking to Fenner and all these places, stopping there. Time meant nothing to him. Like you know, and he'd have a cup of tea here and a cup of tea there. I think he used to play a game of cards in some houses. Like you know, but that was his whole his whole life, just visiting people. And everybody used to be honoured to get a visit from him, like, you know, he was kind of a holy man, like, you know. Mm. And, and someone mentioned, too, that quite a lot of priests would come to Tremor on their holidays. Oh, they would, yeah. What we they had up in the up there was, um, uh, see, the church was changed around 1964. Uh, and um, it was completely referred to, but there was, a load, there was a load of side altars up there. There was three or four side altars. So things were so busy in the summer with all the priests, the altars would be going the whole time, be, you know. And when we were altar boys, we used to be up there, like, you know, we'd get a half a crown off of some of them, you'd get nothing off of others. But we used to be serving them, like, they'd be saying masses at different times up there on the side altars. Oh, yeah, there used to be all the priests used to come there, we used to know them all, like, And would know. they stay then up in the house? The well, they would, yeah. Some of them used to stay down in Murphy's, down opposite the Deluxe, uh, May Murphy's Atlantic Hotel. That's where they, an awful lot of them used to stay, and the Christian Brothers used to stay there as well. Some of the priests used to stay there. Maybe some of them used to stay up with the priests. I couldn't tell you, but there used to be a, a load of priests used to come here and for the for the for the for their holidays. Yeah. They'd say mass up there, and we'd we'd serve the mass, like you know, like I said, we get a few bobs sometimes, we get not the other times. And someone said that the the Christian Brothers used to go out to the Gillamine. To oh, that's right. Yeah, the Christian Brothers were supposed to have started the Gillamine there. Shortly after they came to Tremor in 1867, they were supposed to be the first people to swim out of the Gillamine. But uh, there's very little history about the Gillamine because most people always reckoned about the Gillamine. Like, you know, a crowd of crackpots used to be going over there in the winter time. You know what I mean? That's what they used to do. They used to go over there, like, and swim in the winter, like, you know. 
and uh, people never really took that much. You know, there was no kind of a history to that. Somebody asked me one time, I was involved with the Gilliamine for years and years, I swam all the year round for over 30 years, and I was the PRO for them for years, but somebody asked me, they were looking for the history of the Gilliamine, but the Gilliamine on Newtown Cove, there's no history there. It was just people went over there and they swam there. But uh, there was no such thing as, uh, maybe sometime maybe in the 1940s or 50s, they uh, they, started, they started asking for subscriptions, like, you know, towards the upkeep of it. People used to give five pounds of a subscription. But there was no, there's no history to the Gilliamine, like, you know. But it was strictly men only. Oh, it was strictly men only, all right, yeah. Oh, it was strictly men only, yeah. I see fellas getting on to women coming down there from time to time, all right, like, you know, years ago, like, you know, which was ridiculous. I'd say there's more women swim there now than men, like, you know. Ah, yeah, but I was up way back. Oh, way back. Oh, just way, uh, way back. Yeah, I remember being, a, I, I remember uh, uh, um, being over there one day and there was a man there. Uh, he was, uh, he wasn't there then, like, you know, he was dead for years and years and years. A Mr. Mr. Carroll, he was from the top of Newtown Hill and his daughter was over there and she was fairly elderly now, like, you know. And somebody said to her, you're coming down to the Gillamine. And she said, oh, no, she said. She said, if my father thought I was down in the Gillamine, she said, he turned in his grave. Yeah, yeah. She she was, no, she wouldn't go down. Yeah, Her father was uh, swam in the Gillamine all his life. He, he was in his 90s, I think, when he died, but she wouldn't go down. She said, he turned in his grave. That's classic. Yeah, yeah. And that sign then was down there. That just started to be daubed after a while then, men only, like, you know. So they put a notice on this to say that was only retained as a symbol of... Olden times, like you know, but. And when when did that finish then? That men only. Ah, uh, men only. Ash was kind of just gradually disintegrated. You know what I mean? It just fell away, like you know, just fell away. Um, people just ignored it, like you know, and you know, just women became members there as well, like you know, it was ridiculous, really. You know, everybody was entitled to swim there. Yeah. You know, of course, there's tidal down there. Like you know, you can only swim there at certain. T- uh, at, um, you can't swim in Newtown Cove. Like you know what I mean? It's only, there's always water in the Gillamine. Like you know, there's, there's always about ten feet of water. But um, Newtown Cove, the tide goes out completely. Like you know what I mean? But I always like swimming over there. Like you know, there was a great old, there used to be a great old crack over there. Like you know, and it, an awful lot of the fellas now that used to swim there are gone. Like you know. Jim Hurley from Waterford, Finton O'Brien, you know Finton, the school teacher. They used to swim out there, yeah. We used to have a, a dinner every year then as well. Well, like a dinner dance kind yeah, of? Yeah, well, it wouldn't be a dance, it would be all, you know, all fellas, like, you know. We'd be all down there in no shades. We'd all drink. Yeah. They'd be, they'd just start off, like, you know what I mean? There'd be a busload come from Waterford. And uh, you'd be, you might use a certain pub in Tremor before you go down to O'Shea's. I should uh, drinking would get kind of out of hand then, and they go down then for the meal, and to be complaining the meal would be cold, like you know. And uh, would they start off with they with a swim, or would they? Oh no, they wouldn't start off with a swim. This would be in the, be in the winter time, like you know, be coming up to Christmas, like you know, or maybe one particular night, like. But we were down there for years. We had a had a few good good nights down there. There was a presentation made to. A, we had a, a lovely evening down there. One Sam Moore was his name. He was originally from Riverstone, but he was swimming at the Gillamine for about seventy years. And um, a fine man, but um, he um, he was moving moving from Tremor to live down in West Cork, so we had a dinner for him down there. I have a photograph of it, the dinner. I think it's around nineteen ninety six. So we had a dinner there with steak and drink and everything. We had a great day all together. Yeah. And um, I I know we're going to take pictures of the photographs. Yeah. But what for, just tell us a little bit about some of the photographs you have. What kind of photographs have you collected over the years? Uh, will I show you some of the photographs now? Will I get yeah, well, how are we going to do that? How do you want to do it, Keith? We can do it over the shoulder. I'm just watching the time as well because I have to pick okay. an Amy by quarter. To well, let's go get to all the photographs now. Yeah. Uh, if you sit for you, I'll just jump over the shoulder for the quickest. Okay. All right.